Good evening, hearty, brave souls. Did you all grow up in Northern Ontario like me? And so this is no big deal. What's the problem? How hard can it be? Anyway. Well, welcome. Welcome to the 2013-2014 Lectures in Catholic Experience. My name is Christina Vanin. I'm a faculty member in the Department of Religious Studies here at St. Jerome's University and the coordinator of this year's lecture series. So, be, as usual, before we get started, would you please turn off any, anything that's in your pocket or bag that might make any kind of sound that we do not want on the video of this. Please and thank you. Great. Tonight's lecture on religion and politics was established in memory of the Honorable John J. Wintermeyer. I have to tell you, we are so pleased that John's grandson, John Wintermeyer III, uh, just moved back it, it, to this area from Ottawa in the fall and made some contact in the last couple of weeks, and so we're so happy that he could be here with us this evening. The testimonials that were written after the passing of John Wintermeyer all talk about him as a man of deep faith, of charity, and integrity. And they also testify to his concern for working to develop a truly just society. During his time in municipal politics for the city of Kitchener and in provincial politics for Waterloo North, Wintermeyer was honored for his commitment and dedication to the community. For example, he served on the boards of local organizations like the Working Center, the St. Vincent de Paul Society, St. John's Kitchen, and Reaching Our Outdoor Friends. When he was leader of the official opposition in the Ontario legislator, legislature, Wintermeyer worked on critical social issues, such as the need for hospital and medical insurance, for education reform, for improvements in public service, for equality of opportunity, and for constitutional changes. So given John Wintermeyer's long and devoted service to public life, and the role of religion and the importance of religion in his own life, it is especially fitting that we have Dr. Paul Litt with us to give this lecture this year. Dr. Litt is an associate professor in the Department of History and in the School of Canadian Studies at Carleton University. And there he is also the director of the MA in Public History program. As well, he has worked for the Ontario Heritage Foundation and he has been a policy advisor at the Ontario Ministry of Culture. Dr. Litt's research interests are focused on the intersection of culture, nationalism, and the mass media in 20th century Canada. His most recent book, Elusive Destiny, The Political Vocation of John Napier Turner, is a political biography of this leading English Canadian liberal of the 1970s and 1980s. So please join me in welcoming Paul Litt to speak to us tonight about the just society that Pierre Trudeau promised at the time of the 1968 election. Was it just a slogan? Paul Litt. Thanks very much, Christina. And um, thanks to all of you for coming. I appreciate the honor of being asked to give this lecture. And um, I have a little bit of business to start off with. My son, who has applied to Waterloo for next fall, told me that I should threaten to refuse to talk <laughs> unless his application is accepted. So is there anybody here who objects? <laughs> OK, we can move forward then. Um, when I started thinking about what I might talk about tonight, um, I was working on something related to the 1968 election, and I was having problems with the Just Society slogan. Because at that point, I wasn't seeing any substance to it. Um, that's how we ended up with this title for this lecture. Subsequently, um, I did some more research, and I found, yes, there was something to it. And I'm going to get to that in a little while. But um, in the process of getting there, I expanded the topic somewhat. So as you can see on the right side, I'm going to be talking about the Just Society, but I'm going to be talking about it as the kind of culmination of a series of events and uh, a series of uh, ideas that circulated in Canadian society throughout the 60s, 
and uh, contextualize it that way. And um, so really, this has turned into a lecture about the formation of a Canadian identity in the 1960s. Um, and what I'm going to be arguing is that in the 1960s, um, there was a unique conjunction of factors that consolidated a particularly durable Canadian identity. I'm arguing that. You can take issue with it if you want. Um, while I'm arguing that, though, I have a couple of questions that uh, I want to throw back to you afterwards. And um, one of them is, you know, how durable was that identity? Do we still subscribe to that identity today? Um, you can be good judges of that. And the other is that uh, I see in this period two different, perhaps complementary, images of Canada competing. And as the notice about the lecture suggested, one of them is the peaceable kingdom, and the other is, of course, the just society. So the question will be, you know, are they in competition? Are they uh, complementary? Um, and, you know, how does Canada today reflect one or the other, or one more than the other? So if you're comfortable with that, uh, I'll move on to the next slide. Ah, that worked. This is basically the structure of uh, what I'm going to be talking about tonight. And um, I'm not going to be trying to argue that, you know, this is the uh, only time in which Canadian nationalism blossomed in Canadian history. It wasn't. Um, but what I will be arguing was that, as I suggested just a few moments ago, this was a particularly potent combination of factors coming together all at once. So you had, in the greater uh, scheme of things, a kind of geopolitical context that Canada was in in the 1950s and 1960s that made it strive towards a more autonomous definition of its nationality. Um, and then on top of that, you had this cottage industry in Canadian identity theorizing throughout the 19, early 1960s, which put ideas into circulation that became popularized and helped provide the cement for a new identity being formed. And then finally, the uh, third factor that came together with those previous two was the, um, all the simultaneous shared experiences that people in Canada had during the Centennial and Expo and Trudeau mania that gave them a sense of participating together in a collective enterprise. Um, and then, of course, with Trudeau mania, we'll end up back at the uh, Just Society. Along the way, I'm going to have some comments about how the identity formation of Canada in that period fits within nationalism theory. And it fits quite well. There's all kinds of uh, ways in which theorists of nationalism have said that you uh, should go about if you're going to go about forming a nation. This is how you do it. All of those things seem to be happening in Canada at that time. But just to uh, digress a little bit, <coughs> This is the 1980s, and you can see where the uh, revolutionary promise of the 60s ended up, you know, a mere 10 years or so later, you know, with uh, big hair bands and neon shorts and uh, J.R. Ewing boom boxes. I wanted to start in the 80s because, in a curious way, I came to this topic through the 1980s. When I was working on the biography of John Turner, um, and I was looking at the 1984 election, because in Canada in the 1984 election, a curious thing happened. Everywhere else in the um, English-speaking world, there had been a move to uh, you know, retrench, go to a more neoliberal government. Uh, Thatcher had been elected in 1979. Reagan, subsequently, um, you know, the, the, uh, or all the discourse about de the deficit being a problem had been in circulation for over a decade at that point. Uh, you know, in the bigger context of things, Canada had these wonderfully prosperous decades following the Second World War. And um, Keynesian economics were in vogue. The welfare state was being built. And then they ran into some problems with the oil crisis and stagflation. And suddenly you could see a counterattack, an ideological counterattack from uh, you know, Milton Friedman, the Chicago School of Economics. Classical economics were coming back. They said that, you know, the welfare state was too big, it was um, interfering with the free workings of the market, and that the work ethic was being undermined. So 
that kind of stuff was, you know, if you read the Globe and Mail in those days, you could see it every day, um, various other media, and it was expected that in 1984, Canada would follow suit. We had, you know, Brian Mulroney, elected leader of the uh, Conservative Party. He was expected to um, introduce more conservative fiscal policies. And, you know, the Liberals elected John Turner because he was seen to be, you know, a business-friendly type of Liberal. And so the curious thing that happened at this point was that the election came along and nobody talked about the deficit. Um, they quickly found out that, you know, if you talked about the deficit, you were seen to be mean-spirited and somehow un-Canadian. And so both of those leaders soft-pedaled the, uh, the whole fiscal issue throughout that election. And if they were buttonholed about it, you know, they'd be kind of vague and say, yeah, it was a problem, but they basically ran away from it. And uh, I put this slide up because <coughs> later on in um, Mulroney's tenure as prime minister, there was the issue of trying to de-index old age uh, pensions. And uh, the, uh, I think this was Michael Wilson, his finance minister's project. And Mulroney really wanted to capture the center ground in Canadian politics and take it away from the Liberals. And so that's why he didn't talk about deficits much during the election. And when this uh, issue came up, suddenly there were busloads of seniors headed for Parliament Hill, and they converged to protest the uh, potential de-indexing of their pensions. And Mulroney, you know, wanting to be a popular prime minister, um, decided that the optics of chiseling little old ladies out of their pensions wasn't what he wanted, and he totally backed away from it. So you have to go on until, what, the early 90s before um, there's a con concerted attack on the deficit under um, the Cretchen government with uh, Paul Martin Jr. as the finance minister. So all of this I found curious because it seemed that Canadians were somehow more resistant to that neoliberal uh, counterattack in the late 70s, early 80s. And to find the answer for that, I went back to the 1960s. So, I have a bit of a caveat about what I'm going to be talking about, because I'm not talking about the Canadian nation in, in the sense that this was what Canada was really like. I'm talking about the Canadian national identity in terms of what Canadian nationalists thought about it at the time and what they hoped Canada would be like. So, you know, the nation in this context is being imagined somewhat, and it's being imagined by a certain type of people, right? It's the people who circulate ideas, it's the people who are uh, in positions of influence in the media, in academia, um, in education, and so on. It's the people who make their living by making meaning, and um, they're very influential in this process. And also, there's a risk here, I think, of identifying the Canadian identity with one uh, point on the political spectrum or one type of partisan politics. Um, and that's very true because the identity at this point that was formed was very much center left. Um, but that was the uh, political, uh, that was the part of the political spectrum at the time that was in the ascendant. And um, it'll also be part of the question I'll be asking you later because we've lived through very different times recently in terms of where we're at politically. So to get to more to the context, Canada after the Second World War was in this uh, pretty heady space where it was punching above its weight in international affairs, um, you know, helping to organize the post-war world in uh, concert with the United Nations and um, the Americans. And you know, it had been on the victorious side in the Second World War. And so the British identity is being left behind generally during this period. Historians argue about, you know, to what extent and so on and whether it was just uh, going underground and being manifested in other forms. But overall, it's safe to say, you know, things symbolically like adopting the Maple Leaf flag um, show you that Canada was leaving behind a certain brand of British identity. In the past, it was simply enough to say we're a British North American nation 
you know, we have these American characteristics because we're located here, but we will counterbalance the American influence with uh, British antidote or counterbalance, counterweight of some kind. Now, um, that's passe, and I think the flag debate really symbolizes that. So there's this moment, you know, I put colony to nation to colony because Harold Innes sardonically said that that's been Canada's trajectory in the uh, 20th century, um, going from the, uh, the British orbit into the orbit of the Americans. But there's this moment in the post-war period where it, it feels like Canada is truly independent and there's a need for a new identity, and uh, one that will replace the old British associations. Um, the classic problem, which I'll just sort of introduce parenthetically here for um, Canada in devising an identity, is that the dominant form of nationalism is romantic nationalism, which comes out of Western Europe, where you could argue that you know there is a rough congruity between national or between the borders of states and between the peoples who occupy them. And it, or at least over time, they have become culturally relatively homogenous and therefore justify the congruence between the nation and the state. Nothing like that exists in Canada. It doesn't have hundreds of years of history. It's a relatively new um, settler nation in a different place in North America. It encompasses widely diverse regions over a vast territory, and you know there's the French-English divide, plus there's all kinds of other ethnicities as well. So the challenge for um, Canadian nationalists is that they're still thinking in a romantic nationalist mode that Canada needs an identity as a, you know, a national unifying force to justify its existence as an independent nation. But that kind of homogenous identity that is typical of what's imagined to be the uh, European nation state is impossible to achieve in Canada. So that's a major challenge for identity theorists in Canada. The other thing that happens in this period is that um, in the initial post-war period, the US is the good guy. It's seen as the uh, stalwart shining defender of liberal democracy in the world. It's going to fight the battle, lead the battle against uh, communism and win. But there's a series of PR problems that the US has. Um, so Canada has formed these alliances with the United States um, for continental defense um, and uh, in other areas as well. It's very much seen as the junior partner of the US in the 1950s. That relationship becomes less attractive as the decade progresses. <clears throat> and you have a series of things happening in the US that make you know, that association less desirable for Canadian nationalists. Um, one of them is, of course, the promise of the Kennedy regime being snuffed out with his assassination. Um, and that's only the first of many assassinations that will mark American public life in the 1960s. The um, reaction in Canada is, is uh, two-sided. There's a lot of sympathy, um, and there's also a lot of, you know, despair about a society in which this could happen and comfort that, you know, that didn't happen here and couldn't happen here. The other thing is that Canadians are left with a real desire to have a Kennedy of their own. They've seen this wonderfully glamorous uh, president in the U.S. and what have they got? You know, they've got John Diefenbaker and, um, <coughs> and then they've got Lester Pearson. I mean, they're nice guys, but they're not that dynamic and not terribly exciting. So. There's that legacy from the Kennedy uh, regime. The other uh, issue that comes up, obviously, as the Cold War weighs on, wears on, is that uh, people get really tired of, they're stressed by the possibility of nuclear annihilation, and they get tired of the whole thing, and they tend to associate that more and more with the United States and not with Canada. And there's the whole Bullmark missile um, issue in Canada where it seems that the Americans are meddling in Canadian politics in order to get us to go nuclear, and we're supposed to be purer than that. Um, but um, this idea that the US has that it can save the world by destroying it is uh, increasingly seen to be ridiculous. And that's why I put up Dr. Strangelove here as an example. And then, of course, there's the civil rights movement the um, 
the civil rights movement should also be seen in a broader context, and that is in terms of the uh, long, longer running and uh, broader and focused human rights movement that comes out of the Second World War. Um, you know, the horrors of the Holocaust, teaching lessons about racism, and subsequently, uh, you know, the United Nations passing the, uh, its declaration on human rights in 1948. And so, all of that thrust in terms of responding to the Holocaust um, ends up making the way that American or the United States is treating its black population look all the more intolerable. And uh, so that becomes another way in which Canadians, you know, are having questions about their association <coughs> with the Americans. And this rights movement will, of course, uh, continue on and become a big part of the 1960s. Right? It's, uh, it uh, develops into women's rights, that's just around the corner, gay rights, and, and so on down the road. And the uh, bombing in North Vietnam, it's another example of how um, well, brutal uh, militarism in the United States, where the military industrial complex is killing on a mass scale. <coughs> um, and it's redolent of a kind of amoral technocracy in the United States where they just uh, are betraying the, uh, the noble ends of their project by the means that they use to fulfill it. Another big thing that Canadians are seeing in the US is ghetto riots in all of the uh, major American cities. So you have the decline of um, the great American city, and uh, of course this is related to race as well. <coughs> and it's also tied in with the assassinations. And the overall picture is one of a, you know, a civilization in decline, out of control, it's lost its bearings, and is uh, descending into chaos. The, um, the attitude of Canadians is, you know, there's always been a bit of resentment against the superior power and prestige of the United States, and so it's a bit of schadenfreude here, taking comfort in the discomfort of the Americans in these trying times. And, of course, the response is to say, well, as I suggested earlier, we're not like that. Like, we don't have problems with our black population. Um, we're not racist, um, and so on down the line. Nationalists tend to be you know, self-congratulatory and they tend to define themselves in terms of how they're not like other groups, how they're better than other groups. And in the Canadian context, it's interesting because um, I remember when I was growing up, I would watch the, uh, what would it be, Channel 7 in Buffalo? And there was always like arson in Tonawanda and a murder in Lackawanda or something like that. And I thought, my God, that society is just wacko. It's going to hell in a handbasket. And that was all that was going on there, I thought, from the presentation I got on uh, Channel 7 News with Irv Weinstein. So <laughs> there's that sense that, you know, you take the worst that's projected from the U.S. and um, assume that it's like that. Um, it's the privilege of being on the outside and not having to feel that you're part of it, you're responsible for it. And um, as I suggested earlier, that uh, we're better than them because of it. And I love this quote from uh, Martin Short because it captures that whole kind of comfort of the marginal perspective that you can know what's going on there and yet not, not be part of it, not be responsible for it. And of course, in this sense, this is something I'm still working on, getting a handle on, but there's an, an interesting intersection here between um, Canadian identity or the way that Canada looks at the U.S. and all of these problems that I've enumerated and uh, the counterculture, which is, or not the counterculture so much as the protest movements in the U.S. and um, student radicals who are protesting the Vietnam War, the ones who are the foot soldiers in civil rights. And uh, so all of that gets sort of linked together and Canada... Um, and the counterculture have this kind of association. And, you know, the counterculture and the protest movements, um, it's a youth project, right? It's um, the young students who are doing this. And the interesting thing for me about this is that when people are talking about Canada uh, in those days, it's a standard trope for nationalists, but they think of the nation 
as an individual. They personify the nation. Right? It's got its own characteristics. It's a nation among other nations, like an individual would be a, an individual in a community of nations. Um, and they always talk about Canada coming of age in the 1960s. So in that sense, Canada itself is youthful, and it's also sharing in the youthful idealism of the student protesters, and has a kind of moral purity to it that they have to, they're idealized as, well, these idealistic young people. Um, so, those are all the reasons that there is no percentage in being American, but if you're going to be theorizing the Canadian identity, you've got a problem, and that is that Canada, especially English Canada and the United States, are so similar in so many ways. And so you've got your work cut out for you. Um, you know, it's called, uh, maybe Michael Ignatieff who said that uh, Canadian identity theorizing is the narcissism of small differences. You really have to look for the slightest little differentiation. Um, but that's not a problem because whenever a question of nationalism comes to the fore, there tends to be an eager band of intellectuals they're ready to uh, meet the challenge. Um, these are you know, people like me who aren't a fit for any real work, and so they have to find a way of allying themselves with the powerful by gratifying them. They're kind of the rumpled stiltskins of, uh, of nationhood. because They take the thinnest little reeds. Well, instead of weaving straw into gold, they take the thinnest reeds and try to build these pillars of national identity out of them. So there's a whole series of these people. Um, I'm only going to talk about two or three of the most influential right now. Um, <coughs> but the, this role of, intel of intellectuals in uh, theorizing nation goes way back because uh, one of the earliest uh, intellectuals to talk about nationalism uh, the German, uh, what was his name, Johann Gottfried Herder, had said that it was the, uh, the role of the intellectual really to find out what was distinct about the nation and to communicate that to the populace. And so that's exactly what these uh, Canadian intellectuals are doing at this time. So we've already done that. Moving right along. The first one I want to talk about is W.L. Morton, a Canadian historian. Um, who published a book called The Canadian Identity in 1961. So you can see that's right on topic for me. Um, and the ideas that came out of this book became um, almost bedrock ideas for this uh, identity formation process in the 1960s. The, uh, you'll always hear this first one. You know, <coughs> Canada is uh, about peace, order, and good government. That's in its constitution, as opposed to the American constitution, which has life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. So this idea that you know, in Canada, authority comes first. In the British tradition of British liberty, that um, there is order, and freedom is carved out of that order. And beyond that, another little interesting wrinkle, given the uh, quandary that romantic nationalism has in the Canadian context, and that is this idea that British liberty is more tolerant of diversity than American republicanism. And there are many tortured arguments to make this point, but what it comes down to is that, you know, in a republican uh, polity, you're always susceptible to the tyranny of the majority. Whereas Morton argues, in a society of allegiance or in a polity of allegiance, such as that in the British parliamentary tradition with the crown, all you have to do is be loyal to the crown, and you can uh, have any other values that you want, any other ethnic identity, any other language. As long as you're loyal, you belong. And so that's the distinction he's making. And he sees the American <coughs> um, political culture as being very different, as being one in which you gain membership by you know, subscribing to the American values that are in the American Constitution and the American dream, and there being a lot of peer pressure to conform in that way. And of course, the third point that he makes is the classic and perennial point about Canadians being a northern people. 
which is an interesting one. I mean, it's got, uh, in the past, it's had many kind of uh, racial overtones. It gets uh, shorn of those in the post-war period. <clears throat> but there's still this notion that comes along with it that Canadians are strivers and achievers in the worst environment in the world. Um, you know, again, congratulations for being here tonight. It's proof of that. And um, that there's a certain purity uh, that comes of being in the northern environment. The next one I want to talk about is one you've probably heard of as well, Lament for a Nation by George Grant. And in this book, he takes all of those negative things about American society that I enumerated earlier and you know, reduces it to one devastating critique. And his, his main complaint about American society is that it's godless. It doesn't have any moral direction. It worships freedom for its own sake. And you, know, you end up with freedom of inquiry leading to this technocracy running wild. They worship technique in itself, and you know, that's the means, that's not the ends. Um, and you know, capitalism running rampant without any uh, moral constraints on it as well. And the occasion for him to write this book was the uh, defeat of the Diefenbaker government by the liberals. He sees the liberals as um, being guilty of having led the sellout of Canada throughout the middle of the 20th century and promoting continentalism at every turn. So although it's supposed to be a, a eulogy, uh, this has a very stimulating effect on Canadian nationalism in the period. I'm always reminded of uh, Monty Python's I'm not quite dead yet line, you know, because after this, there's a real revival and lots of nationalists on the left, Grant's on the right, um, take it as an inspiration for um, their further efforts to promote Canadian nationalism. <clears throat> and the third big piece in this period is, uh, comes from an odd place, the literary history of Canada. But the, the fact that the literary history of Canada is being written is in itself, I think, significant in this period. Um, Canada has a culture, apparently. And uh, so Northrop Fry, who's the literary star of the Canadian Firmament, is asked to write the conclusion, make some sense <coughs> of this whole enterprise. And he comes up with some ideas that still are very popular in uh, Canadian cultural criticism. <coughs> the where is here line, the garrison mentality. The gar garrison mentality um, brings in the North once again. Um, and in many ways, he. Uh, he agrees with Morton about the importance of authority in the Canadian tradition and how that distinguishes it from Canada. Um, and of course, the, rec the, uh, the type of tolerance in the society that follows from that. Um, but the real contribution that he makes is the notion of the peaceable kingdom. And uh, again, this is kind of odd because he borrows the image from the United States. And this is a, uh, a painting by a folk artist um, who is a Quaker um, depicting the native peoples agreeing on a treaty with William Penn um, and with the uh, scriptural reference the notion of the peaceful kingdom where you know, the various beasts of carnivores and potential victims, the prey, are uh, quietly coexisting. And people are coexisting with nature and amongst the people themselves, people from different origins, <coughs> there's uh, a treaty making process going on. So there's harmony and tolerance there as well. And he says that, you know, this used to be uh, a rallying image in American culture. Americans have gone elsewhere now. Uh, but in the Canadian tradition, he can see that this is the, uh, the holy grail, more or less, that there's a quest for the peaceable kingdom. <coughs> so the interesting thing that happens subsequently is you get this conflation between Fry's peaceable kingdom and Morton's peace order and good government, 
and the peacekeeping role that Canada has had since uh, Lester Pearson won the Nobel Prize for resolving the Suez Crisis. <coughs> and all these things start to come together and you know, the Peaceable Kingdom slogan becomes the, uh, the way of packaging them all. And um, you end up with this notion of the Peaceable Kingdom being a kind of moral commonwealth predicated on shared values that Canadians have that distinguish them from the United States. And besides all these rough associations, you have uh, these ideas trickling down and getting widely circulated in Canadian society. It's kind of reassuring for uh, a, an academic to find out that some people at one time actually read what they wrote and then you know, understood it and passed it on and it became popularized. But throughout this period, you know, you'd think of the people like Pierre Burton, <coughs> um, survival, Margaret Atwood, she's using Garrison mentality idea. And uh, this book by William Kilbourne, which came out in 1970, um, packages all of these Canadian identity markers in, in one handy volume for people. Um, so the sociology of this is kind of interesting because you know, you're talking about the way the Canadian publishing industry works and the media industries in Canada work. You're talking about a few dozen people in Toronto, right? <laughs> who are taking these ideas and distributing them nationwide and popularizing them. I mean, they all live in the annex. They all, uh, you know, wear buckskin jackets on weekends and they all uh, have long liquid lunches with Jack McClelland, their publisher. Um, and they keep a draft dodger in the spare bedroom when necessary. It's, it's a very small group of people. And yet these, uh, you know, that's all that's required in the Canadian context to get these ideas out there. Um, and once they're repeated often enough, you know, people start to believe them. And you end up with uh, this, which is my dazzling matrix of Canadian identity characteristics that are in circulation by the mid-1960s. Um, so if you look at them, you can see all these notions of uh, the peaceable kingdom as part of it. You know, Canada it wasn't violent in its origins evolved rather than having a revolution, the peace order of good government thing, um, the cities thing, the peacekeeping thing, and so on. And you can also see that that idea of uh, unity and diversity, of plurality, of tolerance is being incorporated as well. So those two key ideas are coming out of this. Um, and I'm not quite sure if, you've, if I've caught the symbols of all these right, but you know, if you can suggest better ones, please let me know. There's um, a few comments I have on this. One is that, you know, first of all, it's accuracy. Um, when you look at the rise of the welfare state in the 20th century, Canada was kind of late to the party. Like the US was there with the New Deal a lot earlier, and it was only very recently that Canada had surpassed the US with health care in uh, building the welfare state. So there's a lot of, you know, flattering self-deception about this, but that didn't matter. It was ahead right now, and that was what they were going to uh, etch in stone. Um, the idea of tolerance, well, you know, Canadians, English Canadians hadn't been very good about tolerating uh, the French language for the previous few generations. Um, Aboriginal peoples, you know, uh, ethnic minorities of all kinds. Uh, uh, in a way, you know, Canada was a failed uh, nation if you look at it in terms of romantic nationalism, it had tried to assimilate and failed. Uh, but the good part about that was that in the post-war period, uh, as the human rights movement became more and more uh, important and influential, that having failed to assimilate was a good thing because you could model yourself as the uh, new style, pluralistic and tolerant nation, a model for other nations worldwide. Um, the other thing about this is that it makes Canada look unique, but only it is only in comparison to the U.S., right? There are other um, countries in the Western world and the world generally where, you know, cities were safe to live in and where there was uh, an extensive uh, social safety net. So um, this looked good, but, you know, I guess the Americans were the only um, 
comparison that really mattered. The, um, the other thing that's interesting to think about, and I haven't really gotten to the bottom of this yet either, is where this all sits in terms of secularization in Canadian society and in the Western world in general. Um, again, historians argue about you know, how rapid and how complete secularization was, but the 60s are seen as kind of a key decade um, when at least a lot of overt displays of piety and uh, rates of church going declined significantly in, uh, in Canada in particular. And so I find it really interesting in that context that you have a United Church minister by training, Northrop Frye, um, creating an image like the peaceable kingdom and equating that with the nation. It seems like the focus you know, where people are going to look for moral leadership is increasingly going to be the nation rather than the church as it had been in the past. It's taking on that kind of role in this period. Um, The other thing that I wanted to mention, and this also s confuses me somewhat at this point, um, is this association with the counterculture. I mentioned before that you know um, a big part of the 60s and youth was associated with liberation, right? liberation from convention, from conformity of the 50s, liberation from uh, traditional Christian values or Victorian morality, if you will. Um, the sexual revolution, and all of these things. And that Canada's um, decolonization, if you want to put it that way, or Canada's national liberation was of a piece with that. Um, but at the same time, there's, you know, this is contradictory, I know, but, uh, you know, there's um, nothing that makes logical sense in history, so I just wanted to mention these cross currents. In the, in the 60s, there's also a striving for a new type, a new style of community, right? There's the famous hippie commune, um, and I, I, I see the, um, the peaceable kingdom as being that kind of sense of uh, an ideal community that you could aspire to in, in this period. It's a remaking of society where the old order, the old authority is being left behind, but a new one has to be created to take its place. Um, so there are, that's the context, those are the ideas that are in circulation, and there's a couple of problems facing the identity theorists at this point. One is the one that I described before about how do you uh, reconcile romantic nationalism, which calls for uh, unity through homogeneity with the Canadian demographic reality. And um, they've gotten past that, as I've described. They've, they've found these ways of um, arguing that Canada is, uh, you know, has unity and diversity and is a more uh, tolerant nation and that that makes it, uh, it gives it an ideal that coheres while still being pluralistic. But the other problem is that in the 1960s where everything is so future oriented and all about change and celebration of change and grasping for the future, um, it doesn't really work to have a fusty old British tradition of liberty as a defining characteristic of your nation. And Canada itself wants to leave Britain behind, right? So that's where you get this uh, novel invention by Gad Horowitz of the Red Tory, which we all, all hear about. Um, but basically what he's doing, and uh, there it is, is he's taking the uh, things that conservatives and uh, social Democrats or socialists have in common and thinking differently, you know, taking the political spectrum and saying, well, they're not left and right. They actually have much more in common if you would put them in opposition to liberal individualism as the primary sole value. Uh, and that's the problem with the U.S., right? That's the critique that Grant had of the U.S. So there's got to be a more organic conception of society, <coughs> one in which there is some kind of moral um, guidance as opposed to untrammeled in liberal individualism. Uh, 
And that's how you get this new creature called the Red Tory. And the wonderful thing about this is it takes that old tradition um, and projects it into the future and makes it uh, more palatable to the uh, progressive spirit of the 60s. So you can be, uh, you know, a Canadian nationalist and not be mired in uh, a musty British past. You can define the differences in the superiority of Canadian society in opposition to the U.S. in a, in a way that's new and in tune with the swinging 60s. So, we've got you know, the big context in place, we've got these ideas circulating, and then what happens in 1967-68 is you have these very intense national experiences in which everybody feels like they're part of a collective, uh, a formative collective um, Canadianness. And by those, I mean Centennial and Expo 67 and the election of Pierre Trudeau. I said I'd mention um, some nationalism theory. And one of the things that's key to nationalism theory is the role of the mass media. Uh, and the way it, it enables populations that are diverse and far flung to feel a sense of commonality. And I put this slide up because, you know, here you have a case where somebody from Moncton could be talking to somebody from Prince Rupert uh, about the gold medal game, and they've both experienced it. They've both uh, made it part of their memories, and it becomes part of what they define as Canadian. So <clears throat> the period that I'm talking about was full of opportunities like this. There's that, that way in which the, uh, the mass media conquers space and bind people together. But it's also important in this process to bind time to make people feel like they have a commonality that goes back to the primordial mists of time and has worked through history. And so there's almost a sense of temporal momentum to the collective that will carry it through present day trials and towards a glorious future. So I remember when I was a little kid, there was a uh, jingle for a television show that said, it's about time, it's about space, or something like that. I can't remember what the name of the show was. but that's what we're talking about here. The way in which these collective experiences of Canadians bind both time and space simultaneously to form the nation. And uh, to that end, there's a couple of things I'd really like to talk about in relation to the centennial. Because <clears throat> two of the big things, there's a lot of things going on, there's lots of culture, lots of uh, entertainment. Uh, but one of the big impulses of the centennial was retrospective. It was, you know, holy smokes, we've got 100 years of history behind us now. That means we do have a history of our own. And let's, ex let's explore it, let's celebrate it. A lot of the centennial grants went to uh, community museums or archives or heritage conservation projects, that sort of thing. Um, so you get this dawning awareness of Canadian history. <coughs> and the use of Canadian history to celebrate the centennial with things like the um, Voyager canoe pageant, which goes right back to the fur trade, or the train, the transcontinental train, which, was, uh, which had an exhibition about Canadian history inside it, which is uh, kind of boxes within boxes. That's interesting. But both of these are also, you know, in the, in the great Laurentian tradition, space-binding exercises where you had the nation bound together by know, the CPR, by the train, and also, you know, previous to that, the antecedents of that, um, it's all good Harold Innes stuff, uh, were the fur trade routes. And um, so all of this is being performed by Canadians during the 1967 centennial celebrations. <coughs> 
<coughs> and uh, well, that's about all I have to say about that. It's interesting that there's that retrospective emphasis to a lot of the centennial celebrations when you contrast it with Expo 67, which was so futuristic. <laughs> and so you have that sense of, well, we've got a past and we're coming from that past and you know, here is our future together. And it was materialized on these islands in Montreal for all Canadians to see. Um, Often when we talk about nationalism and what gratifies nationalist sentiment, we talk exclusively about national unity and what you know, Canadians have in common. But nationalism doesn't just seek after unity and identity. It also is part of that international system, right? So nationalism seeks after international status. It wants prestige among other nations. And Expo also was incredibly gratifying in that way. It was an international success. Canada garnered praise from all of uh, Europe and farther afield. And Canadians started to think, wow, you know, we've, really, we've really made it now. They were astonished at themselves for having pulled it off and you know, ready for more. So many commentators have said this that uh, you know, Expo 67 made Pierre Trudeau popular, or possible, I should say. Um, and it's almost as if Canadians wanted to institutionalize in government the experiences that they had during centennial year <coughs> and sought out a candidate who could do that for them. So you have a lot of the 60s tropes being uh, associated with Trudeau, like he's sexy, uh, <coughs> he's young, uh, he wasn't that young, but you know he appeared to be young. He had all this this, this youthful aura about him. Um, he was single, and that, that helped with the sexy part. And um, you know, you got to ask yourself, you know, to what extent was true to all these things, and to what extent were all of these desirable characteristics of the '60s being projected onto Trudeau in order to make him a fitting leader for uh, Canada at that time? Um, it was also, you know, one of the great attractions of Trudeau was that other countries thought he was pretty nifty as well. And so Canadians garnered a lot of praise for having the, the gumption to elect such an unconventional leader for themselves. And they uh, basked in that praise as well. So. We finally made it to the just society. This hasn't been false advertising after all. I finally come to the point that I promised. And it becomes a very big theme in um, the early part of uh, Trudeau's campaign for the leadership of the Liberal Party. And famously, at the convention, once he wins the convention, he goes to the podium and he declares, you know, Canada will be a just society. And it then subsequently, again, you know, becomes a, a theme in his speeches during the federal election campaign that spring that follows upon his election to leadership. Um, and when you start looking at the just society and what it really meant, as I described earlier, it's, it's a bit disconcerting at first because um, when you hear Trudeau talking about the just society, one of the first things he says is, well, regional economic development. That's really disappointing. <laughs> uh, language rights, okay, that's you know, a bit loftier. Uh, but you end up having a long laundry list of policy planks that are associated with the just society. So instead of this, um, you know, shining ideal like the peaceable kingdom of some kind of new moral commonwealth, you end up with a bunch of, you know, seemingly mundane political promises. And uh, when you start looking at it, what Trudeau's getting at eventually is that uh, it's a form of 20th century liberalism where uh, instead of just leaving 
or assuming that everybody's starting from an equal uh, starting point, level playing field, whichever cliche you want to use, that um, he is going to try to guarantee equality of opportunity and allow people to compete on a relatively equal footing. <clears throat> but what people make out of that is up to them. So it's you know staunchly individualistic. It's still you know grounded in his liberalism, in his very strong liberalism. Um, what people do with their freedom is you know not going to necessarily create any one coherent outcome at the end. Um, so it's curious because you know there was a conference here a few years ago on Trudeau's spirituality, on his Catholicism, right? where everybody agreed that oh, he had a very deep faith he had. He was, he was a believer in Catholicism all his life, and um, it was a big part of his existence. So all you can really see here is a kind of commitment to social justice through liberal means. And uh, you know, it's the uh, United Church minister, Northrop Fry, who provides the, uh, the shining vision of the moral commonwealth. Uh, there's a couple of explanations for that, I suppose. One is that uh, Trudeau was a product of 1950s Duplessis uh, regime in Quebec, or I should say opposition to it. And um, he'd always thought that there had been a problem with having you know, the church's um, complicity with that regime. And so I think he did want a separation of church and state in this case. And uh, you know, it's the same for the same reason he was anti-nationalist. Um, so there's something happening here which is uh, somewhat sleight of hand politically. There's this shining ideal of the just society proffered by Trudeau. But when you come down to it, there's uh, nothing more than a 20th century liberalism that's promising equality of opportunity in the just society. Um, <clears throat> in the long term, of course, you have, uh, Trudeau would argue that this led to the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, which redefined uh, Canadian identity in the sense that you know, that's supposed to be the thing that people rally around. That's the, uh, the central set of values for Canadians that gives national unity to the Canadian state. Um, but um, I'm not sure that uh, when you go back to, say, the election in 1984 or subsequently and you ask people about the Canadian identity, they will answer you. They might say, you know, the charter, but they won't say, oh, we're all about liberal individualism. I think that all of those values that are in the chart that I put up, um, well, in my experience at least, they still have some kind of resonance <coughs> and they still prevail, which is, outst you know, it's a really remarkable fact that they do, if in fact they do, maybe I'm wrong. Um, who's the guy who does those? Oh, Michael Adams he publishes books like uh, Fire and Ice, in which he talks about how Canadian values are divergent from those of the U.S. and continue to be, and are um, going, you know, Canada's going to be even more different in the future. Um, and my own interaction with my students, I'll talk to them about these things and uh, ask them, you know, what have been the formative experiences for you in being Canadians? Like, what do you think of as the Canadian identity and so on? And once you get past hockey and a few other things like that, they will give you pretty much the same list <coughs> as um, coalesced in the 1960s, which I find remarkable because, you know, for the past 20 years, we've had taxation rates going down, government getting smaller. Um, the peaceable kingdom is hard to uh, you know, defend and promote when you're fighting in Afghanistan. Um, you know, the Americans have health care now. You can go down a long list of ways in which the current social reality of Canada does not match up with the ideals that were formulated as uh, the Canadian identity in the 1960s. Yet those notions still have traction for some reason. Um, so I guess that's, you know, originally the, I said that was one of the questions I wanted to put to you. Do you think that those ideals still prevail? Um, if so, why? And uh, 
is it still a question of the peaceable kingdom being the Canadian identity, or is it more the just society uh, that Trudeau had uh, put forward? And, uh, you know, particularly as embodied in the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. Uh, and finally, are those two things you know, necessarily in competition, or are we able to maintain all of our uh, all the contradictions in our identity simultaneously. <laughs> so, those are my thoughts on the just society. Thank you for your patience and attention. And um, I'll leave those questions with you. Thank you. Don't go anywhere. Okay. Dr. Litz agreed to take questions or comments or discussions around his questions or your questions to him. So if you have a question, please, there's a microphone over there. There's one way over there, but most of you are on this side. So, And I'll let you manage them on your own. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Yes. I can hear you. Oh, can they hear me? Can you guys hear him? Okay. okay. You're growing, you were talking about the growing secularization of our society. And we see that in... Um, programs like the church has used to do in the past, education, hospitalization, social uh, wor welfare, uh, orphanages, and mm -hmm. that's been taken over by society, thank God, because it costs billions of dollars to do that. Now, uh, also, then you mentioned, talked about the secularization of morality, mm -hmm. and with so few, like 10 or 20 percent of people going to church, the moral law seems to be set more by uh, either parliament or the Supreme Courts, So, and you suggested that that's, that's being taken over by the state too. Could you, could you say more about that? Yeah, one of the uh, points that I could have mentioned but I didn't was that part of the, fr part of the way that uh, Trudeau uh, rocketed to fame was by associating himself with that, uh, it might have been just serendipity, but associating himself with that free, freeing or liberating of society from uh, Victorian morality because you know, he had, uh, in 1967, amendments to the, criti to the criminal code uh, that uh, decriminalized abortion and uh, homosexuality, to a certain degree at least. And uh, he also passed a new divorce act. Right? So he, um, in that way, was seen as being part of the, the youth movement of the 60s and the sexual revolution, you know, getting rid of all that fusty old imposition of uh, Victorian morality. Um, but uh, what uh, struck me when you were talking about these things is, you know, they're, if to the extent that they were transferred from the church to the state, the state um, took control or took responsibility for them for, what, 20 years? <laughs> and then started to find them too expensive? And then started to put caps on and cuts and rolling back, right? Um, and you would see that too in relation to the abortion law because by the time it was tested by the Charter of Rights or against the Charter of Rights, then you ended up with no abortion law. So that's, that ended up being the end game here, which is perhaps an unfortunate one. Um, well, I would argue it is an unfortunate one. Uh, whether you know that's because of what's become of the state due to that neoliberal counterattack I've talked about, or whether it's an inherent problem with having the state perform those roles. Um, that's an interesting question to debate. Yeah. Oh, he was asking how comfortable uh, Paul Martin Sr and Mitchell Sharp were with campaigning on the Just Society. Um, part of the reason I didn't think the Just Society was much more than a slogan originally was that they didn't campaign on it. It was just all Trudeau. <laughs> it was just so popular um, that uh, that really became the campaign. But you know, the Just Society slogan was very uh, much of a piece with his image because of his association with uh, those reforms to the criminal code, uh, 
and um, the uh, the whole liberalization theme of the '60s, you know, was, and uh, the Just Society was his, uh, you know, just an easy way of saying we're going to uh, remake society in accord with this uh, '60s ideal of justice, of social justice, uh, but. You know, it's uh, as I said before. It's not. It, it adds up to be a really uninspiring package <laughs> package uh, to to put forward as a political platform, and um, it it was kind of the stuff of you get in speeches. But quite frequently during that campaign, Trudeau just threw away his speeches and uh, was adored by the crowd, and that was enough. You know, I I remember one description of him coming into a town in. I think it might have been Nelson, BC, or something. And you know, it's a standard motorcade, and he's sitting on the uh, back of the convertible with uh, two beautiful women on either side, and he's holding a dozen roses. And he goes up to uh, speak at the local shopping center, and uh, he launches into his speech, and people are just cheering him and cheering him. So he ends up taking the roses and throwing them into the crowd. <laughs> that's that's the event. Um, so I don't think the Just Society really. I mean fit with the image and it fit with the times and everything, but it wasn't the, uh, the thing that made, made him in 1968. Yeah? There's been a lot of commentary recently about you know what's called the militarization of Canadian memory, with uh, direct involvement by the government in trying to turn the story from one of peacekeeping, you know, in line with the peaceful kingdom, to one of celebration of Canada's military involvement in uh, various wars. And uh, I, I think you know that's not the issue that bothers me because there's a high tolerance for uh, contradiction and uh, the ex coexistence of contradictory. Uh, narratives in, in uh, these sorts of things. Throughout the Peaceful Kingdom phase, for instance, you know, you're only uh, 20 years after the Second World War. The uh, whole Remembrance Day veterans' uh, presence in Canadian society is, is uh, very pronounced at that time. Um, so I guess you know, the way to reconcile is if to say we were fighting for freedom or we were fighting for peace and it was a noble uh, endeavor in that sense, and I, I think that's possible to do, but um, what I think is distinctive about this government, and that, you know, every government has its own agenda and emphasizes different things in uh, history in accord with it, what its agenda is, but what's different about this government to me is that the extent to which it's propaganda and not, you know, a general um, encouragement of knowledge, development, and diffusion. And uh, you know you can see this; it's on the scientific side as well, right? The uh, things that have happened to the National Research Council, to the Fisheries Libraries, you can go down a long list. The, the Stats Can issue. There's a kind of anti-intellectualism to it. So it's not as if they're out there encouraging scholarship on, you know, the First World War, uh, and for diverse viewpoints on the First World War, uh, which of course is the, the one at hand because it's the the, the big anniversary that's coming up. Uh, and it's also, you know, for them, I think the political calculation is, well, sure, there was conscription, so, you know, the French Canadians weren't happy, but we don't need them to get elected anyways. So I'm not sure, did I answer your question? <laughs> okay. I, 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 and what you're touching on is what, you know, the question I asked and what really fascinates me is that how in the face of a contradictory reality, ideas like this can have such a long shelf life because they haven't been operational for like a quarter century or more, in my mind. Yeah? There are about three things that uh, struck me when you were talking. I, don't, I think I'll try to do them chronologically. We're looking at the decline of the church that you were talking about. <coughs> Look at the Vatican Council, Second Vatican, 1962. 
and the whole, and then the decline of the seminaries and the decline of people entering the priesthood, the decline of people mm -hmm. entering the, the sisterhood, suddenly the church isn't capable of doing those duties which had done previously. Mm -hmm. And it relates to the fundamental changes within the churches, not just the Catholic Church itself, in the 60s, the same era you're talking about. Mm -hmm. We kind of forget that. We say, oh, we, we've lost all these things. Actually, we don't have anybody to run them anyway. And, and, and so the state has to step in. So there's a, there's a counter argument to that. Mm -hmm. The second one was in the 1960s when there were student protests. They weren't protesting Canadian society. They were protesting the war in Vietnam. They were protesting what was going on in the United States or Maoist China, but they were not protesting Canada. Mm -hmm. And the third thing is, take that year 1968 and then look at Kermansky's book, The Year That Shook the World, student revolutions all over the world from Czechoslovakia to France to Germany to Mexico. What country didn't have anything of significance? What country is entirely missed in his book? Canada. So the very time you're thinking, well, all this is happening, look what's really happening elsewhere in the world. And what we've done here is modest by, by comparison. And the unrest is modest, if, if it even exists at all. Mm -hmm. So you've got to say, OK, look what's happening in the 60s everywhere but here. And then you say, yeah, well, by comparison, this is a peaceful kingdom. Mm -hmm. And there was not much significant unrest. And what unrest there was was focused externally, not so in France when they were taking over the universities, not so in Germany, not so in Czechoslovakia, not so mm -hmm. in, even in Asia. It's just in Canada. Because I asked someone one time what they thought of Kermansky's book. And he said, well, it doesn't mention Canada. And I said, yes, it doesn't, exactly. So I mean, when you're talking yeah. about all these themes, trying to just focus them on Canada, you actually have to at the same time look what was happening everywhere, not just the United States. Mm -hmm. and then I think you've got a whole different focus. And when you're talking about society and religion, you've got to look at what's really happening, not just in Canada, especially not just in Quebec, not the ultramontane decline, but what's happening in the churches in general. Mm -hmm. So it's much more complex. Uh, that's one story to another. <laughs> on the one hand, you're absolutely right. And on the other hand, there are all these other issues yeah. that I think are yeah. relevant. And, uh, I mean and that's not a question, obviously. Or just to that's further, I mean, to augment your comment about uh, you know, the, uh, the other thing that's happening is what Jane Jacobs moves to Toronto, right? And it's sub Toronto the good and all, all of that. And it's, it's yeah. right along those lines. It's, you know, everything's going to hell elsewhere. But I, I did that in the American context. And you could talk about what's going on elsewhere as well. But I think that the, uh, you know, the prime focus or the prime comparison for Canadian nationalists is always the U.S. Sure. And that, in that, yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, yeah. But I would, I would argue that that's a bias of the, you know, the Canadian nationalist uh, is, uh, to think in terms of the U.S. because it's the, uh, you know, the threat next door. Right. Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> how many? Uh, I just wanted to ask them one last time. Like, how many? How many people think that those values are still circulating and potent? Um, <laughs> I shouldn't ask it that way. I should ask it who doesn't, and then nobody will put up their hands. <laughs> okay. Well, I'm still trying to puzzle through this, and. Uh, Thanks for your uh, time and attention. So I'd now like to invite forward Dr. Whitney Lackenbauer, who's the chair of our <coughs> uh, history department here at St. Jerome's, to formally thank our speaker on our behalf. All right, thanks, Christina. Thanks, Professor Litt, for an interesting uh, reflection on just society. I think giving us a, a really interesting look at Canadian identity formation for sure and asking this question about substance right framing it around these two competing visions I think you gave us a blend of intellectual history uh, cultural history certainly identity politics nationalism right a concept that Trudeau on the one hand eschewed but also propagated in his other acts and framing it around this idea of what imagined community right you reference Benedict Anderson Canada imagined itself to wanting to be and I think as as Ken was suggesting in a global context as well really demonstrating to us how as historians we place all this emphasis on context and really seeing this just society the way you laid it out as being a product of all of these forces taking shape in Canada in the 50s partly relating to the secularization society right being part of Grant's deep lament for this conservative vision that's disappearing but also politics is this vehicle for social change 
but taking on a different hue than we saw with the social gospel or Uru Navarum and social face to Catholicism of earlier generations. What I found striking in looking at the Just Society was you left out, in my mind, the central figure in it all, which was Pierre Trudeau. And in essence, we got the context of Canadian society, but we didn't get the context of Trudeau the man, the image, the force that explains 1968. And you talked about his association with a lot of these currents in the 60s, right? What looks like a bizarre sort of statement on Indian rights, for example, in the white paper, but really makes sense when we look at the civil rights movement in the US and desegregation and assimilation as being a positive force. You touch on, I think, some of that as well, this grounding in his liberalism. But what I found striking was authors at that conference in May of 2003 who came here struggled to put a finger exactly on Trudeau and how faith connected to his politics, but all insisted, even Tom Axworthy, who said his Catholicism was part of his, ide his identity. It was only part. It wasn't all of it, but by God, it was central to his identity. And I, I found interesting that there wasn't a lot of talk about the Catholic society from which Trudeau emerged, how his readings in theology, his readings in, in Catholic philosophy underpinned a lot of his beliefs that may have eventually taken shape in this liberal rhetoric, but in my mind really helped to explain a lot of what was actually animating the just society. And you found it quite inspiring, and I just thought I'm going to humor me for a couple minutes and read a couple of the, the quotes from just society. And tell me whether in the current context, where I think I'm maybe a little jaded towards the political rhetoric or lack of inspiring rhetoric in this country, whether this really is hollow. Quote, my notion of justice is the old Aristotelian one, that every individual should receive what is due to him or her. It's simply a question of fairness. At college, I realized that some of my classmates had to do their homework on the kitchen table, surrounded by the rest of the family, while I had a room of my own at home. I was always ambitious. I always wanted to be the head of the class, but I didn't want to compete with special advantages while my opponents had one hand tied behind their backs. So a just society means equal opportunities. Saint Exupéry told the story of traveling by train from France to Poland and seeing on board a little boy, the son of poor immigrants. Maybe this is Mozart, he thought, but he'd never have a chance to learn an instrument because his parents have nothing to eat. And I used to think of all the wasted potential in the organization of societies that don't give equal opportunities to all. John Wester Wintermeyer would love this stuff. Um, that doesn't mean that everyone should have a piano and be able to play it. It means that everyone should have a chance to fulfill him or herself according to his or her potential. Rather than trying to build a society that is founded on concepts of quantity, the governments that I had the honor of leading tried to make more and more of their decisions based on quality. We didn't reject the material values, the civilization of the more that brought Canada to a very advanced degree of progress and gave Canadians one of the very highest standards of living in the world. But we were saying that now, having reached the point where there are enough goods and enough technological skills, we should be able to help the less fortunate and trade off some of our material aims and goals for more spiritual, more qualitative values. It's not the affluent society that I hear talked about in Ottawa today. To me, this is animated by gospel values, even if he's turning to an existentialist like Saint Exupéry to present it in, you know, reflecting back. Again, justice to me, from Trudeau, is a warm spirit born of tolerance and wisdom, present everywhere, ready to serve the highest purposes of rational man. Jesuit logic maybe here too. To seek to create the just society must be amongst the highest of those human purposes. Because we are mortal and imperfect, very Catholic, it is a task we will never finish. No government or society ever will. But from our honest and ceaseless effort, we will draw strength and inspiration. We will discover new and better values. We will achieve an unprecedented level of human consciousness. On the never-ending road to perfect justice, very Catholic, we will, in other words, succeed in creating the most humane and compassionate society possible. I don't hear this from politicians these days. These are inspiring words to me as a Catholic and as a citizen. And as well, something that animates our mission here at St. Jerome's, a lot of what we reflect upon as well, is these aspirational statements that we may question the substance, how they actually manifested themselves in policy. But these are big, bold aspirations of, of what Canada should be and how this is not just confined to Canada itself, but how we have to project Canadian values to the greater world. Never before in history has the disparity between the rich and the poor, the comfortable and the starving, been so extreme. Never before have mass communication so vividly informed the sufferers of the extent of their misery. Never before have the privileged societies possessed weapons so powerful that their employment in the defense of privilege would destroy the haves and have-nots indiscriminately. We are faced with an overwhelming challenge. In meeting it, the world must be our constituency. 
I mean, to me, those are profoundly inspiring messages. So I agree with you that maybe there's skepticism that when we look at the, the Trudeau governments as a whole and the failed peace initiative, however embarrassing it was in its last stages, you know, failed to achieve traction and substance. But I think I find myself maybe much more sympathetic. And maybe you'll just accuse me of being a, a Trudeau file, Trudeau file senior, please. Um, but, you know, in looking at this and saying this was, this was something that was animated, sure, by the context of the 60s and in some ways articulated in those aspirational terms. But they were also grounded in training that he had received as a Catholic in his education and this deep reflection that he'd gone on. So you asked us the question, the just society, was it, a just, was it just a slogan? I'd say maybe it was. On the other hand, it was a just slogan. And I think that's something that maybe I'm often searching for in politics these days. So thank you very much, Professor Litt, for a stimulating uh, presentation. Thank you, Whitney. A couple more things before we finish up. First of all, I want to sincerely thank family and friends and St. Jerome's University for establishing uh, this John J. Wintermeyer lecture and making it possible that we can offer it every year and look at the relationship between religion and politics. And I want to thank again John Wintermeyer III for being with us this evening. I want to remind you that you can sign up in the foyer if you want to receive the latest information about this lecture series or also information about other uh, lectures and events that go on here at St. Jerome's University. Every year, we are able to present uh, the community with a very provocative program of speakers. And we're able to do that uh, at no charge because of the generosity of so many partners and supporters. If you would like to support these lectures, there are donation envelopes, some of them around the room, but there are also some in the foyer. And I want to say thank you, as always, so much to all those who give to us so generously. If you didn't notice on your way in, then pay attention on your way out that Wordsworth Books is with us again this evening. And Dr. Litt's book on John Turner is there, and he's more than happy to sign uh, those copies um, if you would like him to do that. Finally, to let you know that our next lecture will be in a couple of weeks on Friday, February the 7th. Dr. Graham McDonough will be with us to deliver this year's Waterloo Catholic District School Board Lecture. Dr. McDonough is an Assistant Professor of Education and an Associate Fellow at the Center for the Studies in Religion and Society at the University of Victoria. He is going to be with us in February to explore the opportunity that Catholic schools have to help both students and faculty deal with questions and challenges so that we can all participate more fully both in the church and in the world. I hope very much that you will join us in a couple of weeks for that provocative talk. So thank you again for coming this evening. Please have a safe trip home. And until next time, good night. <laughs>